Thank you very much for joining us at a minute past uh, one o'clock East African time. Now we begin here in Kenya and the National Nairobi, rather, Criminal Investigations Department has opened an investigation into the unfortunate and fatal incident at the Strathmore University yesterday. Now the security drill that resulted to injuries and death has been criticized on various quarters with many describing it as reckless. One staffer died and 20 other students were injured during the drill at the university yesterday. Now the drill had been organized by the university and security agencies to test the students alertness and response. However the milk operation went bad when some students were not aware of it. Jumped from as high as fourth floor thinking they were under attack. Well we now want to speak to our Sharon Mamani who is currently at the Strathmore University to get an update of what's happening there today. Sharon thank you very much for joining us. Maybe you can tell us what events uh, what exactly is taking place uh, at the university today. Yes, good afternoon, Betty. Here at the university, uh, at the Strathmore University, uh, you know, normal operations have resumed. Classes are going on as usual, but there is indeed that big incident that took place yesterday with a drill that went bad. One person lost uh, her life and many uh, are still receiving treatment for injuries that were, uh, were received and sustained during that drill. Now, a few minutes ago, uh, the police spokesperson, Charles Owino, was speaking to journalists here at Strathmore University and really what they were saying is that the school was reckless in carrying out um, you know the drill uh, the drill was itself good intentioned as it was a safety and security drill uh, that is encouraged uh, you know just to determine the level of preparedness for disaster but what the spokesperson the police spokesperson was saying is that the school did not uh, inform the highest level of security offices saying that that really put the, in danger the lives of the students here because as it is the level of alertness for not just the students here but indeed a across the country is very high, Betty, especially following the recent attacks we've had on the country. Uh, so such a drill is bound to bring out uh, really a lot of panic and uh, panic itself which would cause and really led to that death yesterday because uh, the person who, the lady who died, uh, you know, died from sustaining uh, sustained head injuries. And it's because of this that um, you know, the police are saying that the school indeed, uh, not pointing fingers, but saying they have a lot to blame because they did not, uh, you know, uh, make them aware of the drill that was going on. Now we know that in a statement yesterday by Strathmore University, the school says that it had informed the Langata OCPD and it is a question that we posed to the police spokesperson saying that uh, then there is a police department that was aware of the drill but they say that that is not protocol and what they were supposed to do is to inform the highest level of officers because as it is in fact when that happened uh, the police was ready to send the rapid response, uh, response unit saying that the situation could actually have gone worse than it was Betty if they people if the police came uh, to respond to it as an actual uh, you know terror uh, situation so just pointing fingers saying that protocol was not observed in carrying out what was meant to be really a well-intentioned security operation Betty. Ms. Sharon we also understand that uh, the administration this uh, university administration is currently held up in a meeting uh, maybe you can tell us uh, what exactly um, do we expect from them once they come out and talk to journalists. Uh, what we expect, Betty, really from the students here, the parents and the entire country, uh, is answers really to how this was supposed to take place. Uh, of course, it's very important to understand, uh, you know, in a normal or in a safe kind of, uh, uh, you know, situation, how a security drill is supposed to take place, what kind of security uh, measures are supposed to take, because a drill is supposed to bring an actual case of a disaster kind of situation or a terror attack. So there is that question of uh, bringing. Uh, you know, to be a sort of an, an actual a situation of a terror incident. But then what kind of uh, precautions are supposed to be taken uh, such that you don't have a real disasters and real, uh, you know, a kind of consequences that was witnessed yesterday with people getting injured and a person losing her life. So if there are questions that even the police spokesperson say that is the school administration itself uh, through its security department that is supposed to answer uh, as a how, what, are they supposed to inform the students well in, well in 
advance. And what uh, Charles Oweno, the police spokesperson, was saying is that uh, students are supposed to be alerted uh, well in advance that there will be a sort of, uh, you know, a drill, an operation, uh, you know, just to show uh, what kind of uh, response people would give in such uh, situations, even if they're not giving exactly the date or what, but they should have had some sort of information, uh, especially with the level of alertness, and that is the emphasis they are putting here, because uh, the situation is really fluid as it is, because the country has really been faced with a number of attacks, and people are on that point where they are very alert to such kind of uh, panic uh, situations, and so uh, they say that the, the level of recklessness by the school was that of not informing the highest level of officers who would have also been part of, uh, you know, um, implementing the security drill, Betty. So we await um, their, their, their communication to us after they come out of the meeting that they're having as a school administration now. Right, Sharon, maybe just before I let you go, let's talk a bit about the students. Have you been able to talk to them? Yesterday, obviously, they were so terrified. And today, of course, having to go back to, you know, the classes and some of them actually had exams. Have you been able to talk to them and what are they saying? Mm -hmm. Uh, Be Betty, the, the level of panic really is, is you can feel it, it's, it's quite high, such that uh, some of them, they would not speak on camera because really you can imagine the kind of fluidity that is uh, at, the at, the, at the university here now, especially bringing, uh, having the perspective of such a kind of an attack, not such kind of attack, but uh, the attack that took place in Garissa University a few uh, months back, one that killed 147 students. So students being in a similar kind of a setup, uh, university, a school setup, which was hit by this kind of a terror attack. You can imagine uh, the sort of uh, feelings and the panic that they are going through. So this is the feeling that is going on here now. But the classes are going on as usual. You can feel the panic, uh, but they would not speak to media. So thank you very much, Sharon Mamani, there reporting from uh, Strathmore University, bringing us up to speed with uh, what is happening there. As she has put it, uh, classes are ongoing, examinations are ongoing, but of course there's still a bit of tension uh, in the school. Well, still keeping with this uh, particular issue, and we want now to speak to uh, Ngumbao Mutua, who is an advocate at the High Court, to just tell us the legalities of what took place uh, uh, yesterday. Thank you very much, sir, for joining joining us you know the question is what legal implications could Strathmore University be facing now right we understand that there's a slight uh, delay there with uh, connecting to Ngumbao Mutua but we will be getting back to him uh, shortly but still on another story that of course is still developing and this is in regard to the climate change uh, the summit that uh, of course in Paris uh, day two let's uh, talk to uh, Alex Chamoda to bring us up to speed with what's happening there after yesterday's statements or presentations by heads of state and government, you may be asking, so what next at the Paris Conference on Climate Change? There's so much that will be happening for the next 10 days. For example, there are ongoing exhibitions in the area of innovation and climate change. There are informal meetings and there will be technical groups that will be discussing technical areas related to climate change. For example, the role of transport in climate change, uh, knowing very well that transportation is a key contributor to emissions that contribute to global warming. There is the area of food security, the impact on agriculture and how to deal with global warming in that sector. There is the area of energy. This is a key sector, and many nations have already given their commitments on how to improve the use of green energy, or what is called clean energy. For example, solar power, wind energy, and geothermal power. Experts in various fields, the civil society, and government organizations will also be making their presence felt here. Another important aspect of this conference is the role of the business community, that any future businesses must be environment friendly. And on that note, let me introduce what President Uhuru Kenyatta told the gathering of 150 leaders yesterday, that there is an upcoming WTO ministerial conference in Nairobi, and this will be a key opportunity to try and link 
business and clean energy. This will be the last of the multilateral conferences in 2015 and the first ever WTO ministerial to take place in Africa. I would like to take this opportunity to call on my distinguished fellow leaders to work with your trade ministers to help ensure a successful outcome in Nairobi, which clearly demonstrates the positive role that trade can play in helping us achieve sustainable development, including through facilitating the trade of renewable energy products and other climate-friendly technologies. By 9th December, it is expected that negotiations will have ended and a possible pact on how to curb emissions to be signed on December the 11th. For now, that's all from Paris. I'm Alex Chamada for KTN News. Great. Now let's go back to that uh, tough story that, of course, uh, I promised an interview with uh, Ngumbao Mutu, who is an advocate at the High Court. This is, of course, in, in regard to the security uh, drill yesterday at the uh, Strathmore University that went fatal, one person dead and 20 other students seriously injured. Uh, thank you very much, Ngumbao, for joining us. Maybe you can talk to us about the um, legal implications that Strathmore University faces uh, thank you very much, uh, Betty. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the legal implication uh, with regard to what happened yesterday at Strathmore is that uh, the question of negligence comes out. Was the drill properly conducted? Was there negligence, recklessness on the part of uh, the university? And uh, Betty, uh, let me say this, that uh, for a drill to be seen uh, to have been uh, successful, we must take out the question of realism. The drill was aimed at showing, or rather, a drill is, 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 is aimed at showing whether students or any person who is affected can take part effectively and how to react in the event of uh, such an occurrence. So uh, the question of negligence, as I said, comes out very clearly because, number one, it is clear that uh, the university did not uh, give sufficient notice to the students. The university is neg is, 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 uh, uh, can be found guilty of negligence because under tort, under the law of tort, which is actionable, the university owed a, a duty of care to the students. But this was not uh, what happened. Instead, they exposed them to dangers, and uh, you can see the, the number of injuries uh, and even the deaths that occurred out of uh, that botched uh, exercise. Oh, you know, the university has come out to say that, you know, on their part, it was properly uh, planned. But also looking at uh, what they said they will do, they said that they will compensate uh, the students and, the, um, you know, the people who were injured uh, in regard to, you know, hospital bills. But is this going to be enough? Can these people who are affected severely, especially the injured ones, uh, move to court and actually sue uh, the university? Um, Betty, the question of uh, whether the university can be sued, uh, the answer is in the affirmative. And as I said, it can be sued on negligence because that is a tort which is actionable uh, for the death and the injuries that occurred. The aim, as I said, of uh, a drill is to create a and uh, to, to enable uh, the people who are uh, taking part to know how to react in the event of such an occurrence. But in this case, what happened is that uh, injuries and deaths uh, was what that came out. So uh, Betty, to answer your question, yes, the university can be sued. It ought to be sued uh, by the people who uh, lost their life, the person who lost their life, together with uh, all the students who uh, got injured. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ngumbao Mutua, for that, uh, for those insights, of, uh, of course, uh, coming in the backdrop of what happened yesterday at uh, the Strathmore University. Now, we want to move on to other developing stories, and more than 400 families are camping at Nyora Primary School in Nyatike in Migori County after they were displaced from their homes by floods. Uh, River Kuja in uh, Migori County bust its banks spilling water to their homesteads. The county government and the 
Red Cross Society has been providing humanitarian assistance to the victims in the last four days with the fear of an outbreak of waterborne diseases. Well, Rashid Ronald has just returned from the camp and filed this report. <laughs> the skies opened last week and annoyed River Kuja, which will then burst its banks, spilling its deadly waters to several places in Nyatike, Migori County. Among those affected were Nyora village, whose residents are now camping at Nyora Primary School for the last three days. Sad pictures here. A woman preparing Sukuma wiki for lunch. Indeed, the faces tells it all. Migori County Governor Okoth Obado visited the camp and donated blankets and foodstuffs. Officers from the Kenya Red Cross have been here for the last three days providing humanitarian assistance. Because we are still trying to capture the segregated data, which should inform which sectors and which ages should be uh, uh, supported with uh, relief uh, aid. In case you are wondering, this is not a lake, neither is it a river, but floods. Believe it or not, we had to leave this place in a hurry for fear of being caught here. Otherwise, one can get stuck here for days. Rashid Ronald, KTN News. In Yatike, Migori County. And that report by Rachel Ronald leads us to a short break. <laughs> we will be back uh, with more news, especially international news and sports news. Stay with us. And welcome back to KTN News Desk at 22 minutes past one o'clock uh, East African time. We want to also look at another story that is uh, developing in the uh, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption uh, Commission de detectives have this morning staged raids on the city homes of uh, former Devolution CS Anwai Guru, PS Peter Mangiti and that of former National Youth Service boss Nelson Gevenji. And uh, of course uh, the detectives are said to be looking for documents crucial to tying up uh, ends in the ongoing probe into loss of funds at the ministry. Now EACC sources say the commission will issue a statement once the operation is complete. Mangiti and Gevenji were mid last month charged for trying to cover up a conspiracy to defraud the National Youth Service of 600 and 95 million shillings uh, while Waguru resigned following pressure over allegations of graft in her ministry. Well, we want to speak to our reporter Muremi Mwangi who was uh, there today morning. Muremi, thank you for joining us. Uh, maybe you can just tell us if the detectives were able to get what they were looking for. Do we know if they were able to? Apparently, Betty, we are still at the gate of the residence of uh, former devolution CS and Waigoro. We are informed that the detectives are still uh, inside the residence, of course, still searching for that uh, information, the documentation, and what they say is evidence uh, regarding that case that they're investigating. Of course, uh, the loss of 695 uh, million shillings at the NYS. We're told they came here at uh, 6.30 in the morning, so that means for like six hours they have been inside the residence. Uh, of course, we spoke to uh, the lawyer for the former CS, Mr. Habit Nasir Abdullahi, and he confirmed that there were people here at that time in the morning, and as that's the last time we spoke to him, he did confirm that he was on his, his way here. So we're still waiting for them to finish up. Uh, that search for the information they say we are still uh, locked up outside they could not uh, let us get in uh, of course they say that uh, they are searching for uh, any documentation and any evidence to uh, assist them in that uh, case uh, over the loss of 695 million shillings at the nys right do we know if uh, the former cs is in her house or did she leave have you um, was there any sort of activity in that regard no, there's confusion, Betty. Uh, a few minutes ago, uh, Kandara MP Alice Wahome passed by here, and when we inquired from her if she was uh, coming to this place in solidarity with the former CS, she told us that she's not even aware if Waiguru is inside the residence. So it's still 
if Waiguru is herself at her, uh, at, uh, inside the residence as that search for the documents continue. But uh, what she said, of course, is that uh, she's also unaware that that raid was to be staged here. But the information we have from the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission is that they got the court order, uh, uh, of course, uh, legitimizing this uh, search in the House. Uh, they got the order yesterday and they got here very uh, early in the morning at 6 30 and they say they still uh the the search is still ongoing this being the sixth hour since they got here right thank you very much uh, for that report that is Moremi mwangi joining us by your phone uh from uh, the former cabinet uh, secretary for devolution and planning uh, anway guru's home here in nairobi where detectives have been there for about uh, six hours now from 6 30 a.m this uh, morning to uh, basically looking uh, looking for documents that are believed to be part of the investigations into the fraud at the ministry now we want to change gears and shift to sports and uh, athletics kenya top brass isaiah kiplagat his vice chairman david okeo and iaaf council member joseph kenya have been shown the door now the trio who have been suspended for six months as investigations uh, continue over sub subversion in the anti-doping control process in the country and allegations of nike fans misappropriation Right, and that's where we wind up this edition of KTN News Desk. Thank you very much for watching. That, of course, was part one. Part two continues in the next few minutes. And uh, we have so much more. Join us on KTN News Channel. My name is Betty Okari. Have a lovely afternoon.